Welcome to the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. The world is changing faster than ever, and the world of education is too. Advances in psychology, biology, and a whole range of other fields have opened up new lines of thought about the purpose of school and how it can best serve a new generation of students. Join me on the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast every week to explore these new ideas. In last week's episode, I was joined by Sam H.P. from the University of York. Sam is the head of the Model United Nation programs at his university. We talked about how students can get involved in MUN and what they might take out of it from the experience. In today's episode, I'll be speaking to Dr. Kevin Bryan. Dr. Bryan is a professor at the University of Toronto who's going to be talking to us about OpenAI's new product, ChatGPT, and the implications of artificial intelligence on things like education, communication, and the world at large. Welcome back to the Braemar Life Skills Academy. I'm your host, Mike Helsby, here at Braemar College, and excited and, and a little bit terrified to be joined today by Dr. Kevin Bryan. Uh, Dr. Kevin Bryan is an associate professor in the University of Toronto's strategic management area. His work primarily consists of applied theoretical and empirical analyses of innovation and entrepreneurship. Among other questions, most relevant to today's focus on chat GPT and AI technologies, he has investigated how startups find early employees and decide where to locate, when and why acquisitions of high-growth startups may be worrying for antitrust, what types of science are most useful for inventors in industry, and how artificial intelligence can be profitably used alongside human workers. His work has been published in the Journal of Economic Theory, the Review of Economics and Statistics, Research Policy, and the University of Chicago Law Review. We're lucky to have him alongside us today. Dr. Brian, welcome to the BLSA podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, Mike. Now, we're going to jump right in, but before we uh, scare the pants off these people and then hopefully give them a bunch of hope and, and creative notions to, to carry into their days, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, maybe how you arrived at U of T and perhaps how you're related to the, the topic at hand? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm trained as um, a mathematical economist. Uh, so so I study game theory, which is uh, essentially um, strategic interaction. Any problem where what I do depends on what you do, what you want to do depends on what I do. Yeah. Um, so of course, this has tons of uh, tons of applications. Um, the ones I'm most interested in are uh, how society creates new things, how they innovate, how these new things diffuse, what causes them to uh, become used more quickly or, or more slowly. Um, as part of that work, I, uh, I also work with um, the University of Toronto's Creative Destruction Lab, which is the, the world's biggest science-based entrepreneurship program. Uh -huh. uh, we've actually had an, an AI stream for, I want to say we're in we're ni our ninth year. Uh, so you've seen tons and tons of companies since back when uh, it wasn't clear how important uh, AI was going to be up until now where... Uh, you know, every uh, every company in the world is uh, is thinking about uh, thinking about what AI means for their business, and uh, and even outside companies, uh, areas like education are thinking quite heavily about how these developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, will affect our day to day work. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So so this is uh. I'm I'm really glad to to be here and chat uh, chat with the Braemar folks about uh, about what's what's new in this this really exciting year. With technologies called generative models that are are getting so much press. Yeah, and and press uh, among them. I mean, the the way that I became aware of you and your work was uh, in an article written in the Atlantic. I think it was December sixth, twenty twenty two. We're sitting here in the middle of January, twenty twenty three. Um, I'm going to get back to that in just a second, but. Uh, You've described yourself as having worked pretty closely with AI and trying to understand how it's going to uh, interact with our marketplace and our lives for the past nine or ten years. Uh, I think for many of us, this is something that's only really been on, you know, on the front of the screen for maybe the last year or two. Maybe we heard something on a on a you know a Sapolsky podcast, or we read Yuval Noah Harari, or heard a little bit about Nick Bockstrom, and a lot of it is is very existential crisisy as opposed to. Um, how is this going to integrate into into our lives and how is it going to make them better and, and and you know the optimism that goes with that so with all that said for the uninitiated like myself today we're talking about the newly released open ai product chat gpt can you just tell us what is it uh, a bit of its history um what are its current abilities and, and what sort of projected uses might we imagine in the future yeah so actually we have to go back a little earlier please do so in the uh, 
AI is not new. Uh, there's some famous uh, books and papers by people like Marvin Minsky going back to like the 50s and 60s. This idea that we could get computers to to be our assistant, uh, to do all these tasks that we don't need to hard code into them. And uh, so, for example, like translating language, there was some idea that I would figure out all the rules of English and French, and I put them in a computer and I give it some text in English. It would tell me what it is in French and do it perfectly. Um, and it turns out that uh, uh, the models that we used didn't work very well. Uh, and we had a bit of an what we call the AI winter so in the 80s and the 90s. You know, it's just completely – you wouldn't even say the word. It was, like, embarrassing to bring up AI. You were seen as someone who didn't understand why this stuff didn't work. Um, however, there were a handful of folks uh, still working on these, these uh, so-called deep learning approaches. Um, probably the most important, actually, was a fellow here in Toronto named Jeff Hinton, hmm. uh, uh, who's a computer scientist here, who, if you know the term uh, deep learning, uh, essentially that's him. Okay, that, He's the one who developed this. And out of his lab, uh, which Google was involved in a bit as well, um, there's a contest uh, <laughs> uh, a contest around image recognition. So this idea is you're going to throw me a bunch of like just pictures, and I'm going to tell you this is a picture of an orange, of a cat, of a dog, of a house, of whatever. And uh, this is a, not, a, not an easy problem, you know, when the house is rotated or upside down or a weird color or has some clouds. Um and they used these deep learning techniques, I want to say it was 2014, and blew away the state of the art. Mm -hmm. Like, absolutely blew away the state of the art. And people thought, <laughs> wow, like, there's there's something to this. Like, what's different? I thought that these techniques were, were, were garbage. Um, and essentially, uh, it was some minor improvements in the algorithm, but it was major improvements in computational power that mattered. So it turns out that, that these type of algorithms just need really, really powerful computers and lots and lots of data. But if you give them those two things, they can do pretty wild, pretty wild tests. So starting in 2014, 2015, after this, uh, this ImageNet competition, just enormous amounts of money go into this field. And this is why these days, um, if you're, you know, like our age, Mike, you remember, uh, you know, 20 years ago, there weren't online translators, you could use them, but they were bad. Yeah. You know, you want to fail your Spanish class. <laughs> use them oh, I translator. remember trying. Yeah. <laughs> These days, the online, I mean, if you were to go, say, uh, you know, open up your web browser, go to Le Monde.fr, the, the French newspaper, and click translate, the is. English looks 99.9% .9 perfect. Okay? Yeah. And that's because they have the same, uh, the same type of machine learning in the background that were used in, in ImageNet to identify images and in many other tasks, um, such as self-driving cars and others. So you've been trying to figure out how can I now what's the exact right way to structure these algorithms so they perform um, tasks as well as possible. And a handful of papers in the last few years uh, basically suggested um, we might be able to use uh, a framework. It's a little too tough to explain uh, uh, over the radio since it's fairly technical, but what's called generators. Um, and the idea here is that I have a huge amount of input, like images or or text. I do a little bit of, uh, you know, hand coding, what we call reinforcement. So I, it gives me an answer. I say, that's good. That's bad. That's good. That's bad. And it learns from that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that these, this, this framework called the generator, this algorithm is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So if I want to say, draw an image, it's an illustration that looks like a Japanese cartoon of like a wave eating a beaver. And we all know this is like things like stable diffusion and Dali does a great job. On the text side, think of the text version of Dolly and Stable Diffusion is, is ChatGPT from a, from a group called OpenAI. Um, and uh, in just in, uh, they, they put out their newest version. Uh, they had, I mean, GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3. ChatGPT is like GPT-3.5. And essentially all they did was they took the previous model where I could type something in and it responded. They made some minor changes. The big change they made was they added some memory. So now it can keep track of things we've said earlier in our conversation in a way that uh, these models didn't used to be able to do. And that makes it feel really like magic. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I can have an outright conversation with it. It can write code for me. It can translate for me. It can improve my written English. Um, there's some things it can't do because it's not built to do so. So it can't access the internet. It can't search the web. It can't do math. There's certain logical reasoning it's pretty bad at. But it turns out we have other similar models that are very good at those tasks too. Mm -hmm. So combined, we're going to have GPT-4 next year. 
and GPT-5, and, and apparently Google's internal version of GPT is even better. Uh, and so these are going to be, be just totally incorporated into Photoshop and Microsoft Word and your email. You're always going to have this little co-pilot with you who's able to essentially understand um, what you're saying. It's obviously it doesn't have a brain, so it's not understanding like a human, but understands enough that you can tell it to do something and it will do it correctly. Yeah. And even think creatively. Think of things you didn't even think you wanted to ask it, but it will understand just like a person could if you asked a similar question. So phenomenal technology. Um, really a huge surprise, actually. I think even people like myself who are heavily involved in this area um, did not expect... Uh, ChatGPT was a bomb. That mm -hmm. uh, everyone who was interested in AI, when they released ChatGPT in no late November, stopped working that day because we were like... How? 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 It's so amazing. It 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 certainly has blown up. It, it has been a bomb. I think in pretty much everybody's lives. I could I can't count on two hands how many conversations I've had with friends just in the past two weeks that have gone the way of ChatGPT. And you might you can sit down with someone at a cafe and they can just look you in the eye and say, ChatGPT, and it, it, like it, it's on everyone's <laughs> mind. Um, in my mind, having I, I believe you, uh, the article that you were cited in in the Atlantic was my first contact with this. Um, and then I coincidentally had a student walk into my office and basically do that. They, she looked me in the eye and said, have you seen ChatGPT? And we started exploring it together. But I, I've, I felt immediately this, this kind of gut churning, tense fear about it. And I got to say, uh, you, you and I chatted for about 15, 20 minutes before uh, starting to record here. And I can, I already feel quite a bit better about this. Like when you talk about this technology, this this product, you bring such a an air of positivity and optimism and and creativity itself. Like a, a feeling of really the possibilities, right? An, an inspired sense of what's coming, and that's making me feel a lot better about this. Uh, the conversation we had also made me realize very quickly that the implications of this technology extend far further, far wider than I had conceived of them. I had been thinking of them largely in educational and uh, creative artistic spaces. And so I'm gonna to try to keep this conversation as much in that realm, the, the realm of the educational implications of this technology, uh, but with the massive caveat that this is going to affect, I think, every part of our lives. It's gonna affect our relationships. It's gonna affect our, the, the nature and length of our work days. It's gonna affect how we understand our worlds and ourselves. Um, it's going to help us understand what we've been doing before this, what what we've been doing that's made a lot of sense and that was intuitive and, and right, and what we've been doing that was perhaps a bit of an illusion and, and perhaps a, a bit of uh, human bias towards the norm acting rather than rather than real rationality. I think we're in for a real period of learning as, as, a, as a species. Um, what does chat GPT do? And especially in relation to the, the article that came out in the, in the Atlantic title, The College Essay is Dead, written by Stephen Marsh, uh, December 20, 2022. Your quote, I have helped run an AI-based entrepreneurship program for years, written papers on the economics of AI, and follow the field quite closely. Nonetheless, I am shocked in bold by how good OpenAI's new chat, OpenAI chat, is. Example, you can no longer give take-home exams slash homework. So again, what is this technology designed to do? And can you just unpack that quote for us a little bit, especially in relation to assessment and take home work? Sure. So, <laughs> and, and again, as you point out, like the focus on cheating is, is, is not, is not the interesting part of chat right. but it is something you need to be aware of in the education world. Hmm. Is it previously, how would I think someone would cheat? I would think that they would plagiarize. So I asked them to do something, they get something off the internet and they just copy it wholesale and makes maybe some small changes. Students, I got to tell you, we got software that will 100% of the time catch you if you do this. And uh, every single essay has run through this. Yeah. It's like automated on our end. We don't have to do it anymore. So you basically can't cheat that way. Yeah. So your, your ability to, um, and then if I ask you like say multiple choice questions, you can just obviously copy off your friend. Um, uh, if I ask you short answer questions, you could probably do the same. Um, I always tell students, uh, I don't know if the students uh, at Braemar read uh, Anna Karenina, but uh, the first line of Anna Karenina famously is that all happy families are the same and all unhappy families are unhappy for different reasons. And likewise, all correct answers are correct uh, in the same way, but all incorrect answers tend to be incorrect for crazily different reasons. And if you're going to copy from your friend, it turns out that we often catch you because 
Only two people in the whole class said something so wildly crazy. Man, I'm, gonna, I'm <laughs> definitely no stealing way. that metaphor from you. We, we've got <laughs> we've got uh, quite a few Russian and Ukrainian students here, and of course, great lovers of literature, and uh, many of whom are reading Anna Karenina. And so, I'm, I'm going to bust that one out from now, and then I'll probably take credit for it too. <laughs> there you go. Like I support it. So, so in case, like, um, you know, that type of cheating is pretty easy to catch. But a, a way of cheating that I just part of the reason I gave these type of assessments is I'd ask you a question that's pretty open ended that has like. 20 different answers and requires a lot of creative thought and you'd write like a page and then you give it back to me. And with chat GPT, if you give it like, say you copy and paste uh, a little five page write up and then a question and you say, chat GPT answer this at the level of a college essay, you know, it's going to do, it's going to do a solid B plus every time. Yeah. I saw, I saw you, you, you did a great job of kind of elaborating on the tests that you had run initially on this chat GPT and you show, you copied them to your Twitter feed and you were very honest about like, I, I've tried, you tried to complicate the questions that you were asking to try to trip this technology up and it kept mm -hmm. delivering what you described as B plus a minus honestly a work. Right. Yeah. So it's, so it's, it's, it's very difficult. Like, I mean, I guess it's not that surprising is that there's, you know, and these are the type of questions that are not just regurgitate class content. These are questions we're asking to like be creative and apply concept A and concept B in a way together that's for sure nowhere written on the internet. Mm. <laughs> if you Google this, you would not find, you would not find something useful and nowhere written in our class documents. It requires some type of logical thought on how these things are connected. And, uh, and uh, ChatGPT is uh, essentially uh, able to understand written language in uh, in a deep enough way to often uh, often answer these correctly now it does do crazy things yeah. so <laughs> i'll tell you how this works how does a large language model work please is that i have uh imagine i say you know like um uh, the dog went to the what would you say backyard backyard park dog spa you know whatever you want to chase the cat chase the squirrel etc so there's a handful of things you could put in that spot so essentially all the llms are doing is they're going to grab essentially everything ever written in the english language <laughs> they're going to ingest it yeah they're going to not take the words but they're going to uh, uh to save a little bit of computational power what they're going to do is they're going to understand certain words or synonyms so they have kind of similar meaning. So like use and utilize more or less mean the same thing. Yeah. So if I, you know, I use the computer, I utilize the computer. You might understand one's a bit more formal and one's a bit less, but otherwise they, they have the same meaning. And so I'm going to take all these words. I'm going to put them in this mathematical space. We call a, 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 a high dimensional Euclidean space. So think of this as I take a word and I turn into a vector of 300 numbers. Yeah. Okay. So once I do that, then I'm going, it turns out when you do that, you can do crazy things. So if you take the the vector for, um, say, man, and you take uh, uh, the vector for queen, and you add those two vectors, so, you know, in mathematics, you can add two vectors together. The word that is closest to the two added vectors is the word king. So in some sense, it, putting these words into this, this mathematical vector space um, re retains the meaning in a, in a, in a, a real way. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Once I've got this in the space, now I'm going to basically train this model by predicting what the next word is. So the dog goes to the, okay. If I just wrote that and knew nothing else, you might say probability 0.2, 20% is backyard, 10% park, 10% dog spot, dot, dot, dot. And now I'm going to, I've got this kind of probability uh, distribution. And now what I'm going to do, I'm, I might randomize a little bit. Now I need to understand your question. So you're going to ask me something like, you know, write me a story about a, a dog who goes for a walk, you know, and it's going to start uh, the dog. And now the model needs to pick the next word. So what's it going to do? It knows the dog, the next word probabilistically of everything ever written is like goes or went or something like that is the most common. Yep. But now I'm just going to update that probability based on the prompt that you wrote. So what you asked me to do, and maybe we're having a conversation, what's happened before, that's the memory I talked about. Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying the dog goes, if I asked you, like, you know, write a story about a dog who, uh, a dog who flies. Okay, so now it understands that it's not going to be that the dog goes to the dog spa. It's going to use a different kind of updated probability, taking into account what it learned from your prompt. 
and it's going to write a different a different sentence. And so that that's really all that's really all that's going on. And the same these same models for like images, all it's doing is predicting given these pixels of these colors, what color should the next pixel be? And it turns out if you give me every image on the internet or every sentence ever written, I can predict in a way that looks like I understand your question. Yeah. That that's yeah. that's that's all there is to it. And all we're going to do from that point forward is we don't want you to say like violent things or racist things or whatever. So we're going to do a little bit of hand, what we call reinforcement, where we say, okay, you wrote this answer, but this answer we don't like. It's really bad. So I'm going to click like minus one. And then when it does a probability update and it sees something that looks like that bad thing, it's going to like downweight that. That's not really what I want, you know? And likewise, if I wanted to train it to answer like medical questions, I would tell it to like overweight predictions that come from these medical related documents. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and then then that's all. That's the entire model. And amazingly, it works. It works if I train this for like a year on giant supercomputers with all the text on the internet. It works. Um, so that's the model. Um, and this is why it looks like it looks like it can think. And there's certain things it'll do great. Like if I if I asked it to like add 274 to four to the sixth, it's going to get the wrong answer probably. Mm -hmm. There's no math model underlying it. Is just trying to predict, and that question's never been asked. Probably nothing that similar to that question's ever been asked. It doesn't do very well. We need some some different type of model to handle a question like that. Um, likewise, if I want to ask it, like you know, what happened in, on January the fifth in uh, in Paraguay this year? Well, it can't search the internet, and the text it grabbed none of it's from January twenty twenty three, so it has no idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, search search on Google for that. But it, it but will still produce other, an answer in that case, right? It'll produce an answer. It'll probably make things up. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it can absolutely like make up citations um, where, where it doesn't know. Like, like I asked it some questions about Shakespeare and like, like it, uh, it gave answers that looked pretty real, but a lot of it was pretty made up. So in order to get the, we call that hallucination hmm. to get the, these models, not to hallucinate facts. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, it'll hallucinate a lot. If you do know how to write the prompts, so how to ask the questions, uh, you can really tamp down the amount of hallucination. Yeah. And uh, I expect people will will quite quickly kind of understand how to, I mean, in the same way, like if you run a spell check, sometimes the spell check is wrong. Like it's like, oh, it doesn't understand this word, but not because I'm wrong. It's just, uh, it's a technical word it doesn't know. Yeah. And so when I use a spell check, I just don't take as given everything it suggests. Likewise, with these large language models, it's going to make stuff up sometimes. It'll be wrong sometimes. So you do need to use your own thought a little bit, but man, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, you know, as uh, we were talking earlier, uh, uh, Mike, about uh, coding, 100% chat GPT using only that model where it predicts the next word from the prior word can write working computer code in the language of your choice that works really well for your task. Whew. So even though and it's, it's not plagiarizing, it's not like it's not like that code is on the internet somewhere already. Like it's totally new, never been written before, and it, when I've used it, ninety nine percent of the time, the code works. My uh, my partner is training to to be a programmer right now. She's been after it for about seven or eight months. Would you recommend a direction towards what you described as co piloting, um, as opposed? She's following a very traditional path right now and just going kind of step by step with an eye towards being, a, I guess, what we would call now a classic coder. Um, but it doesn't I mean, it doesn't sound like that's going to be uh, particularly necessary as a skill set within a, a year or two. So I don't know if like, like, you know, my training was in mathematics. Mm -hmm. Obviously I use calculators. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I could multiply like 678 times 1227. Probably I could do it in my head, but it would take a while and I'd make mistakes. So it's kind of a stupid thing to do, mm. but it's still important for me in that field to have understood kind of what goes on in this. And, you know, so likewise, likewise with the coding, like the copilot, um, we actually, we're actually talking about how to model this um, economically. A lot of these models actually are. Um, we sometimes would say they have uh, they have uh, uh, strategic complementarities or assortative matching, whatever the technical term you want to use. But basically, what it means is that they're more useful the more background knowledge you have. Mm. So, so um, you know, like your if you were like a trained architect using the architecture versions of this, it will fix mistakes and make sure errors don't get made. But it makes you even, you get an even bigger bump if you're the existing architect and you already train that way than someone who doesn't have any training at all. So you, you still want to have that. It's just going to make you even more productive. On the other hand, there are some 
some kind of LLM tasks that are um, are uh, basically let people who don't have as much training catch up. So as an example, like imagine you were a, a you know a Polish construction worker. Your English is like really not good. You recently moved to Toronto and you're not getting contracts because, you know, like you're trying to send this email like, eh, no, can't come now, uh, will be too, you know, like now you can just go into these LLMs. Like, I mean, here, I'll, I'll just do it right now. I'll tell you what it says. Um, so, all right. Uh, 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 it, eh, uh, uh, imagine you are a construction worker with rough English. Fix this to a more formal email, okay? Uh, I not come to tomorrow. Be there uh, five. Fix roof, okay? Nice. Let's see what it does. All right, here we go. All right, the output goes. I will not be able to attend tomorrow. I'll be there at five p.m. to fix the roof. You know, like yeah, brilliant. so. For, for for a person like this, it allows them to, even though they're good at construction but don't have that one skill, it gets them much, much more competitive on getting the contract, mm -hmm. the construction contract, because it fixes this problem they had. So the, your question is essentially like, for a programmer, is it, are they at risk of like the coding being so easy that like no one needs to hire a programmer yes. or, uh, or an illustrator where it happens to be? Or is it the people who already kind of know how to do the illustration and coding? Are they going to get a, such a big bump that they're so productive that they can bang this code out? In? And my, from on the coding side, this kind of rule of thumb from folks I've seen, professional uh, developers saying, I'm saving, I'm putting out twice as many lines of code, finalized lines of code per, per day as I, used to, as I used to. If I gave this to someone who doesn't know how to code at all, they would put out zero lines of code. Yeah. So, right. At least right now, um, it's a big compliment. And it, it's really hard to predict where it's going to go. So a good example is chess. Um, obviously, we know since Deep Blue, the chess computers have been beating the grandmasters. Yes. Um, and now, like, blow away. Yeah. And they're, they're smashing <laughs> us in, in, in uh, Chinese Go now, too, right? In Go, yeah. yeah. Like, we, we, I, I, there's, it is, we are not competitive in no-limit 10-hand Texas Hold'em, where bluffing's involved, okay? Wow. So you, you can never, I mean, they have to like stop you from using these programs when you play online because it's so it's so easy to make money. Right. So um, so the, the thing was, it used to be that even though the computer would kill even the best player in the world, a mediocre grandmaster with a computer could beat the best computer easily, mm. okay? It turns out that's no longer true. So, so a mediocre grandmaster with a computer, what they add is more mistakes than benefits <laughs> at this point. And so, so right now, certainly for coding, um, it looks a lot more like the mediocre coder plus chat GBT blows away the best single computer or the best single coder. Um, in which case you should, I mean, you won't have a choice because all these, all these services like GitHub and Replit and whatever that you use are just going to have this built in. Um, and same if you're like a journalist, you're just going to be be able to write more content more clearly than you used to and, and on and on. Um, will it ever replace some of those tasks and make it so that you just don't have don't have work left? Um, I don't know. It's 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 not it's not totally clear. And I think it's the chess example is really hard to predict. I wouldn't have thought chess would have gone in that way, that uh, the, the humans basically add nothing anymore. Um, but uh, but uh, we'll see. And uh, the other thing about chess on the educational side that's really cool. And, and go for that matter, is that um, <laughs> the quality of human chess has improved a ton since we had these chess computers. Same, same with Go. Hmm. So we've learned certain certain um, tactics. I mean, if you're a bad player, you're like me, it doesn't matter. Like you can read a chess book, you'll get much better. But if you're decent, it turns out there are some things that weren't as good as we thought. And there are other strategies that actually like, if you think through how they work and how they position the board are much more useful than we thought. Yeah. Um, uh, e, e, and this, this is with hundreds of years of studying chess. And so it turns out that in people without computer have gotten much better at this task. And I imagine for things like writing with the and coding with the assistance of, of these large language models, um, our own like writing on paper is going to get better because we're just going to see kind of cleaner writing <laughs> as we write. Yeah. And it's going to help us avoid the throat clearing and the nonsense that we do. 
in, in one sense, it does feel like we're just moving into a, a, like a leveled up arena where all of our illusions about ourselves are being tested against something like reality. Like I, I'm, I'm a, a, an athlete and um, advanced statistics in, in most major sports has really changed the way that quite a few sports are played. For example, yep. the, the most ready example is in the NBA where prior to the 2000s, it would have been very rare for a team to shoot more than 23 pointers in a game. And now you, you almost can't expect to win without shooting 40 plus three pointers a game. Yep. And we don't know what the ceiling is on that. The, the ceiling will be found when a team is brave enough to try 60 a game or 70 a game, right? But I'm, yep. I'm interested to find out whether, uh, uh, you know, AI technologies like this are very, very quickly going to radically kind of just smash us in the face with with kind of these constant aha moments like, oh, why why did we think this was the best strategy in, in American football? Right. Like t turns out, yep. I, I think they've 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 just uh, discovered a year or two ago, at least mathematically, no NFL team, no football team should ever do a traditional kickoff. They should always do an onside kick. The, yep, yep. the cost benefit analysis is massively on the side of onside kicks. So I, I think, yeah, yeah, all of which is to say, uh, just kind of echoing what, what you're saying, but boy, oh boy, it's going to be yeah. a strange two years. And the interesting thing is so, like those examples, like um, um, say how many three pointers should I shoot? I mean, there's the pure statistics way of looking at this. There's a kind of game theoretic way of looking at this where, where I realize the defense is going to adjust if I start jacking up. 63 pointers a game these generative models is that they actually go beyond what i could do with statistics so there's certain tasks that um i mean in the end the un underlying the model is just it's just non-parametric statistics okay done in a clever way but in some sense the generative part is that it's um i think honestly you would call some of what's going on creativity uh in that it's it's a complement to creative thinking so it, rather than just I have an idea that we should shoot more three pointers. The model is 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 like helping me think through how would I how would I investigate you know different strategies that might work better in basketball, and I can kind of chat back and forth with it, and it helps me think through some things that I wouldn't have thought of. Like it's just like having a nice sounding board uh, next to you that you can also ask like and you know I got a good idea now. Okay, now okay, look at it and tell me like have, like having a great assistant right next to you all the time. I was going to say, the co-pilot um, metaphor is a good one. Yeah, I think, I think co-pilot is actually the name of the 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 feature that that one of these companies <laughs> yeah, calls their their. Yeah, well chosen. Code. But I mean, like, why why wouldn't you use that? I mean, it seems, it, 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 again, again, like I put, you probably saw when I, the, the thing you saw online that I wrote um, a few weeks ago um, where I referred to uh, this being like a calculator for all, all the negative and all the positive, like, you know, you go to the store and someone needs a calculator to add seven to ten. You're like, "Geez, Louise, man, go back to school." Yeah, something's gone wrong here. But on the other hand, like you really want, you know, your your structural engineer who's building your house to check their math on a calculator. You know, it's not a bad thing. It just makes them more efficient. And so, so on the educational side, for folks like in your position, thinking through how are we going to use this technology in a way that. Uh, um, is most complimentary uh, to things the students actually need to learn. Um, you know, a little bit of care is needed because, uh, you know, we want to start with the times tables before the calculator. Likewise, uh, we do want people to understand why the output is good writing or not good writing, for example, <laughs> on an essay. We, we want people to, part of the reason we have someone write an essay in school is to be able to think critically about an issue. It's not the actual writing that matters. Yeah. So we don't want them to, sh you know, throw yeah. that part off the computer. And so, so you have to be a little careful and, and how people think about this when they think about say cheating is a lot of them are like, can I use like, you know, a plagiarism check and I'll just see, did the AI write this? And probably you can. Okay. The problem is I want to know whether the student did the original thought. I don't, I don't care whether the student like helped edit their grammar mm -hmm. yeah. using a large language model or even like got, you know, went back and forth on ideas with a large language model, like they should be doing that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like that's, a, that's no different than like looking in an encyclopedia or using a grammar check on Microsoft Word. That's the thing. And I, so, I saw this kid who, uh, this young fellow in Australia got, uh, or may, may have been New Zealand, he got dinged uh, for using chat GPT on a, on a summative assignment. And he um, he kind of pushed back and, and challenged the, the ruling. Basically, he pointed out that there is no, no hard line in between 
um, the type of assisted writing technologies like like Grammarly or, or even Spellcheck that, that we use, uh, or maybe even just having a smart friend sitting next to you that you can bounce ideas off of, and plagiarism or or yeah. quote unquote cheating like that. It's it's a, it's silly to pretend that we're ever going to be able to draw that line again. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So I, I know one person, uh, a professor, suggested that we. You know, you, you allow students to use, you know, which, whatever this technology you want. They just need to specify what they did with it and mm. what they what they did independently. Show your work. Um, in the same way, in the same way you like, yeah, same way you cite sources, uh, for example, in a right. current essay. You can think of this as like citing my digital copilot yeah. sources. And then it's fine, right? I don't think I don't think there's a problem. And then you can say like on, on, on this essay, you know, we're trying to study, you know, writing short sentences. So... I've given you this complex document. Now I want you to write it in a more concise way. Obviously on this assignment, how much you can use chat GPT is zero, right? right? And so, so for different assignments, you might have different rules, but uh, I mean, like, like with plagiarism, there's some, some kind of honor system in the end is going to, going to really be the only way we can, we can uh, do things because there's, as you say, the line is not obvious. Yeah. I've, I've thought that quite a bit in the past, even before this, that, um, the, as you said, the honor system is reliant on, on a value system that we have to um, uh, imply in all of our courses. I think foundationally, the concept that to every student, this is your education, right? Like, we, well, I'm, you're, you're only, mm-hmm. che- we say it a lot, you're only cheating yourself, but quite literally, like, this is your experiment time, this is your, your growing time, you're, you're yeah. responsible for how much you, you take out of this. So I, yeah. I don't, we've done a bad job of making that real to students in the past, right? It's a nice little idea, but I think that's all it's regarded as most of the time. And then we become very meritocratic and cutthroat in our, in our assessment strategies. I think one of the things there's almost, there almost needs to be like a spiritual change in education and, and a more holistic approach to the student in the process of education. Like, like, are you actually learning? And if not, what are you doing? That's um, preventing you from that. Forget, forget the grades, forget 80 or 90 or, or 50 or whatever. And you know, there's there's another another thing that I think will help on on our side is we think of the students using this, but obviously on the on the the teaching side we can use this as well. So right now you can't do this, but technologically there's no reason why in a year you won't be able to. And I'm sure there are companies working on this, where I just take all of all of my content from you know in at my level uh, there's no like textbooks or anything, so all the content is stuff I've written, um, and all my class notes and my slides and whatever, and I just throw that into, uh, you know, right now these these large language models train on a specific data set. So this chat GDP is just general, but there's like a chat GPT that's extra trained on medical oh, uh, cool. data, for instance. So if you want to like, like have like a doctor's assistant, it's actually better than the general chat GPT and, and likewise. So you can imagine uh, a version of chat GPT where I throw in all my teaching material and I ask it, I say, you know, I really want the students this week to focus on this topic, this topic, this topic. One, generate a question bank of 40 questions. Two, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, code up the whatever the Blackboard or whatever you're using so the students have to get 12 of these right and it minorly rotates them until they get them right. And then you can even have like a little like assistant where the student can be like, I don't totally understand um, this topic. Like, why isn't it this? And in the past, I just have to like for every wrong answer, try to write out and guess why the students got it wrong, whatever. I don't, you don't have to do that anymore. Right. Like in literally in a year or two, you'll be able to have like a co-teacher who can answer some of these questions. And you know the the education literature is just overwhelmingly clear that the best mode of education for moving students quickly is um, personalized uh, content. Yeah. So so stu- so it, it, rather than having thirty students in the class, every student as a personal tutor who teaches right to their level and who passes them on to the next topic once they've shown mastery in the previous one. We obviously don't have the ability <laughs> to mm-hmm. do that in our standard classes because we don't have 30 teachers for 30 students. Um, uh, but I think in like a handful of years, it will be seen as crazy to give students like a handout of homework. Yeah. The only acceptable homework to give students will be show mastery on this topic by going back and forth with the AI until the AI says this student understands. Hmm. And, and that, you know, those type of improvements are like just, they're going to be so beneficial. Like no student will be able that like passing your homework will mean you know how to do it. Yeah. And, and, and you won't find out two weeks later when you get it back and you got a D you'll find out right then, Oh, I don't really understand this topic. 
And you'll be able to like chat with the computer on like, what am I getting wrong? And the computer's gonna be like, well, think about it this way. Think about it, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and if it's one where the computer's like, I think the student's still understanding, at that point, there's no reason the computer can't ping you and get you involved right. for the student's ability to know. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is a massive improvement in the same way that the co-piloting for coding is a huge improvement for me as a programmer. Think of like a co-pilot for teaching that allows me to do the things I wish I could have done yeah. to personalize education. That I mean, that's where we're heading. It's gonna be Whew. fantastic. Have you uh, have you read um, Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Oh, listen, come on, man. I'm I'm 38. We all read it. All right, <laughs> just, I, I got to double check. You know, a, a world where I don't have to ask these questions and can just jump in. That's that's the world I want to live in. But it's nice to talk to someone who assumes it. Um, yeah, when he's uh, in his classroom talking about like positing capital Q quality as the, as the prime value and trying to determine how do you arrive at something that is you know, unspeakable, mm-hmm. right? Like you can't, you can't actually articulate what it is. And he democratizes the process, right? He, he asks, okay, you may not be able to say why this is the best paper in the class, but if I've given this paper to 50 of you and, and 48 of you have ranked it in the top three papers in the class, it's very likely approaching quality uh, more mm-hmm. closely than anything else. I can see what I, I can imagine extrapolated from what you just described in very, very short order, us having something like a global um, democratization of, of quality assessment in all work. Yep. Right? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. And it, it will, it, it will also allow um, the amount of time a t- like a teacher spends thinking about stuff like I got to write like, 15 questions for some handout this uh, no one likes doing this right yeah if they I, I don't know if your students listen to this but like this is the <laughs> most do. boring do. part it's of teaching. yeah we, like, can we all hate doing. look at the life um the only experiment <laughs> i've run on chat gpt so far and this will tell you uh, how, <laughs> how obsessed i am as a teacher with this um was to ask it to write lesson plans for ba- varying levels that meet ontario ministry of education standards and this mm-hmm. is obviously something that teachers spend hundreds of hours doing especially earlier on in their careers and it, it was both frustrating and, and powerful and something like magic to see something that would have taken me an hour to, to put together, um, including every single, like all, all three assessment standards met, um, all materials and equipment required included, um, standards for, for learning outcomes right at the top, right? Did any subject, yeah. any topic, any grade level, um, I can I can include specialized aspects, right? And, and it just comes out. So it's, it's going to be a boon in terms of, uh, labor saving for sure. And it's also going to add like the type of skills that are compliments to this, you know, teachers that are kind of able to use this type of technology. Well, so I, I don't know if you play with this, but I met, take like the image generators, the students, uh, I'll, I'll love these, like I'll state of the little, yeah. stuff. Um, if I gave it to, you know, my uncle, he'd get garbage. Uh-huh. There's a way to write the prompts. That's not obvious. That takes some work that creates much higher quality. And likewise, if you were to say like, I wanted a lesson plan that meets these and okay, how should I change it? Like if you know what you're doing on, on, on these type of systems, you can go really quick. If you don't know what you're doing, you'll think it looks like garbage. Right. And you see a lot of commentary online. They're like, Oh, I typed this in and it gave me a bad answer. It's like, well, you don't really understand how this works is the thing. So, so people who are able to kind of, um, think in a way that's congruent with these models, we'll find their productivity goes up quite a bit. And then there are certain tasks that are very hard. When we have more time, so we save some time on things like writing a lesson plan. So things like um, students who have emotional regulation problems, for instance, um, that you know normally we need to you know take a little time out and talk to them and find out what's going on. Like we'll have a little more time, honestly, yeah. um, on the teaching world for this. So teachers who are good at that will find that uh, that's more of their job. Mm-hmm. And teachers who aren't able to do that will find that there's a lot of their job they're not able to do now because that's going to be, you know, half the job. And so um, so I think you'll wind up having, as, as these, you know, we often say like um, these general purpose technologies is, is the economic term. Um, they often change the type of labor uh, that's used in a given field and the type of skills that are necessary in a given field. And uh, I, I'm sure this will be the case. Um, I mean, these these models strike me as like so important that like huge numbers of fields are going to look very, very different than they did before. And certain skills are going to be much less valuable and other skills are going to be much more valuable. And uh, uh, when you ask, you know, about um, should I learn programming the traditional way, I would be thinking more 
in a world where this technology works like a hundred times better than it currently does, are the remain are the is the workday that I'm pursuing in this field, does it sound fun to me or not? Right. <laughs> because it's not what the workday looks like in in uh in 2023. Um that's and same nice. for teaching, same for playing ball, same for, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, like we learn we learn new things. Like a ball player in 1950, the most important stuff was uh, you know, uh smoking a cigar after the game and uh, never working out. And uh, you know now it's uh, it's it's doing yoga and whatever whatever, whatever LeBron and Brady and all these guys do. Yeah, so funny. Eh? It's a very different job, you know. So, <laughs> so right now, um, it's it's been fed this language modeling program, which we need to I think emphasize the the fact that at least in this moment it is not working the way a human brain works. It is not conscious of what it is saying. It does not understand what it is saying. Um, and it likely does not understand the, the deep-seated symbolic implications or, or, or the symbolism of, of a lot of what's said, the connotations of, of how we speak. Because as we know so much well, of... Go ahead, sir. Well, quick <laughs> quick point. Yeah, please correct me. The uh, It's not a correction, but I would say our knowledge of how consciousness and human thought works is is not precise. And it's not obvious that we're not learning something about hu- how humans think yeah. <laughs> from the ability of the computers to do these tasks that we didn't think they'd be able to do. I've, I've so who, who, who knows? Um, but uh, you're probably right. But uh, but I would say uh, it, we, we have a lot more research to do to understand how the human brain works as well. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this teaches us about ourselves. As you said, we don't know how consciousness arises. And I think a lot of people are kind of shocked to hear that. But you give it about 10 seconds of thought and realize, yeah, you don't know how you know that you know uh, anything. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm reminded of, of course, that, that great seminal essay, uh, Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with. Of course, um, but yeah. I think this is probably going to be uh, quite a bit like somebody who goes and actually lives and works with bats for a while compared with somebody who sees a bat on TV and, and assumes they know how it's operating. We have a tendency to infer our own operations, our own mental operations, and assume in a lot of unconscious ways that other animals, other, other experiences at least fall within those parameters, that, that, that it, it kind of happens to them, to those beings in the same way that it happens to us. And so I think a lot of the initial fear and perhaps a lot of the initial um, excitement about this technology is, is built on ideas of what a, what a human being would be like if we could consume not an infinite, but a truly massive amount of text uh, mm maneuver within it uh, at, in a millisecond, uh, scrape it for relevant uh, uh, subject matter, and then use that in, in our own voice. Uh, I don't know yep. that that's exactly how this is going to go, but as you say, it's going to be, as we interact with it uh, over the course of the next months and years, we're going to learn an awful lot about ourselves, and I think it is probably going to learn an awful lot uh, about us and, and what we expect from it as well. Um, yep. Can you tell me, uh, j- just briefly, what text, what data has it been fed so far? Um, so, so for example, my understanding, so it, it, it's not open source, so we don't totally know. Hmm. Um, my understanding is, for example, every single word on Wikipedia um, is part of it. Wow. Um, uh, I suspect, so the new version, GPT-4, that's, that they have internally, um, <laughs> basically uses for all practical purposes, everything written on English on the internet. Um, and actually, this is becoming a bit of a problem. We're kind of running out of training content. So as people have estimated, like, what do I need now? I mean, every word said in an email or in a telephone conversation or whatever, we ca- we need more and more and more to adjust to make this work better. Well, fortunately, the powers uh, that be have been recording that stuff for a couple decades now, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, what's what's Google using? It's not totally clear. Um, uh, where they have access to even more, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you can effectively think of this as we're more or less grabbing everything, everything we can possibly scrape from the internet that's written, it will be used in these models at some point. Um, that's, uh, that's essentially where it's headed. And, and, and that will include every single scanned book, every scanned newspaper, everything. Um, now again, it's not, it's not plagiarism. 
what it learns from like your New York Times article is not to rip off the New York Times. What it learns is that like this word and this word mm -hmm. mathematically have this relation in, in human speech yeah. uh, with some, some probability distribution. I saw, I saw um, a young fellow in Australia just designed a new app that, um, what's he calling it, um, GPT-0, which he claims will distinguish between GPT-generated content and, and human-generated content. And he uses the two metrics. Um, I've got them written down. Why pretend that I'm going to remember them? Perplexity and burstiness. Um, which he describes as kind of burstiness would be um, a measure of humanity's tendency to use varying and inconsistent language models when, when we write more often than a program that has uh, basically generated, uh, understands the patterns of our, our texts very, very uh, minutely and, the, and therefore is less bursty in its content output. If you want a, a, <laughs> one of the wildest chat GPT applications I've seen, is that so there's there's tons of services that can try to check was this written by a computer and 99.9% .9 no problem okay they'll figure it out there's certain way like for one the computer doesn't make spelling or grammar mistakes right. ever yeah so yeah. uh if you were to generate I pro I'm a little worried should I say this given that students are listening <laughs> you'll figure it out we're I'm all sure gonna be there soon enough yeah they already know so if you if you have like an essay and it's written by Chat GBT, and then you say, rewrite this in a way that an algorithm cannot figure out that is written by ChatGPT. Mm. And you take that output and you paste it into these things that supposedly can tell the computer wrote it. The computer can no longer tell that ChatGPT wrote it. Um, and what's it, what it's going to do is going to add kind of, you know, a grammar mistake here and a spelling mistake there. Maybe some of that burstiness that you mentioned. And, and there you go. So... You know, it's it's not a problem for if you, if you ask Hemingway to write in a difficult and convoluted way. I'm sure he could pull it off. He <laughs> wants, yeah, you know, and, especially and later in the day when he's a few whiskeys deep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the words get more slurred by the end. But um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, uh, it is it is uh, it is interesting that um, the computer right now writes differently than us. But you know, it's also true that a writer for the New Yorker writes differently from me and you. And some academic who uses all sorts of jargon and is totally impenetrable also writes different yeah. than me and you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it's not that they can't write a different way. It's just that that's like a norm. And so so this is the kind of thing that uh, I actually have had, had fun playing with that, like rewriting, using ChatGPT to rewrite uh, same, some of my own papers, like write it in the style of Ernest Hemingway or write it in the style of dot, 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 or write it in French or write in, I mean, it's, it's not bad. It does, yeah. it does a good job at this test. I, I completely believe it. I mean, it, it kind of terrifies me that it's consumed, let's say, Shakespeare, Proust, Goethe, um, alongside, you know, Cosmo magazine or, or what, you know, whatever is going on in the, the online chats that, that proliferate. Um, when, when you look at something like Grammarly, which I know is not a direct correlate, but Grammarly will assess your work, assess your writing as it goes, and it'll make sort of hierarchical suggestions or suggestions based on a hierarchy of quality. It'll say, you could write this sentence in this way differently to make it clearer, more sophisticated, whatever you're, you're, you're going for there. Is ChatGPT already a part of the development of some sort of language hierarchy? Like when we, when we aim for clear communication, I think we aim for, you know, writing that is similar to the great uh, writers of the past. Maybe we don't write like Shakespeare, but we, we certainly prize that style of writing. Are we going to see this technology um, starting to differentiate between higher and lower qualities of communication? Yeah, for sure. So, so well, two things. A, a software like Grammarly is largely hard-coded. So something like I have the writings at this grade level, I would like to reduce the grade level. I just know like sentences that are this long that have this many clauses are very difficult to read. And so it just, it's just going to use a rule to ping. Like this mm -hmm. sentence has a lot of clauses, whatever. Um, if I were to ask chat GPT to write something simpler, it doesn't have that rule built in. You know what I mean? It doesn't know. So it's, it's going coming at this task from a completely different tack. I suspect that probably the best way to improve your writing is a combination of the, the two. Like I've got some rules hard coded, plus I've got the LLM to understand the large language model to understand um, what I want when I when I write in in plain language. Like I would like to make this more like Hemingway, and it'll say, okay, what 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 Hemingway would do differently from you is do 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 do. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, 
So, so that that's I think where services like Grammarly will look like. They'll wind up incorporating some of the ideas that are in ChatGPT. Okay. Um, now, for writing in general, it is actually interesting. I think uh, something that's going to become seen as less a marker of education or a skill is writing in a convoluted way. Mm. It's going to anyone, anyone by now, let alone next year when it's built into like Gmail and Word and whatever, can take their Simple email and write a. I would like to request the presence of uh, Mr. Mr. Helsby. Da, da, da. You know, like that's no longer like showing that you know certain codes. It's just showing you know how to use a computer. Right. It's not impressive. It's it, it it'll be the equivalent of like you know the. I'm sure I did this too. Let's be be honest. But like the seventh grader who uses the thesaurus and replaces a, you know, a small word with a less diminutive one. You know, and annoys their teacher. It's not that impressive. We know you know how to look in the thesaurus, okay? Right. And so, I think what we'll tend to prize more is clear, short, uh, straightforward writing, because just like right now, we're not impressed by using a thesaurus, but we really are unimpressed by spelling mistakes on your resume, yeah. because it's so easy to not do this. If you have a tool that will take your complicated, impenetrable writing and make it easier and clearer, and you don't use it, you will be seen as uneducated. Yeah. You'll be seen as someone who doesn't know how to write. And so I, hopefully I think we'll see the, the kind of writing we interact with every day will look more like a kind of, you know, New Yorker, Ernest Hemingway cadence than this like highfalutin academic type of cadence where people are trying to signal, look, um, I'm smart and I know these big words and whatever yeah. it's like. You don't know that we don't know that you're smart in a big words. You may just use the computer, so it's no longer a marker of uh, of that uh, that uh, un, unseen talent. I see what you're um, saying. I, so, I like the, yeah. the constant references to, to Hemingway as well, a fella alongside probably George Orwell, the two most famous English writers who really made a point and a prize of being as simple and clear and direct as possible in, in their writing, and were I think rightly rewarded for it uh, by, by being yep. recognized as prob- that's two of the probably top 10 most popular English language writers of the 20th century. Um, and I, I'm sure you know it's uh, <laughs> writing with short, clear sentences to get an idea across is much harder yeah. than writing yeah. with complicated, long sentences. And it's actually the mark of a, a good writer. And, you know, when, when you're 15, you think it's the opposite because mm-hmm. some of my friends don't know these words and can't use these complex clause structures and whatever. But like you know, once once you're an adult, it turns out a lot of people know how to do that, and we're not really that impressed anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I, I, th- I think that's almost exactly what Hemingway said about Faulkner, right? They, they were the two great writers from from America at that time, and he just he's, he's he's saying, yeah, Faulkner's a great writer, except that I can write in in two sentences what he writes in three pages. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. But we, we can get back together some other day and, and uh, flex our our literary chops if you like. Um, <laughs> We forget, I think, a lot of the time that alongside things like Grammarly and and the synonym function on Microsoft Word and even less obvious things like thesauruses and dictionaries, that even writing itself, it it was a massive technological development in human history, that writing is a technology. I I know that one of your side interests and and kind of one of your your, uh, sincere hobbies is um, a study of scientific history and the history of innovation. Is there anything in the past from something as big and as integrated as writing to, to something as small as a, as a chat bot or, or the little the little paperclip get that used to give me advice on my, my Windows 95? Um, is there any technology that you could compare to this in terms of what it does and what it implies for the future, how it's going to change us? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all in Toronto right now. So probably the most famous, I guess, other than Banting and Best to invent insulin, the most famous... Um, Canadian thinker to come out of Toronto is Marshall McLean. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he said the medium is the message. And his writing was essentially about how uh, the way that we communicate and actually what we communicate depends on the medium we communicate it in. So if we're in email or we're in text messages or we're in we're in writing or speech or television, um, there's different uh, – it's not just the same words – presented in a different way. It's like actually we focus on different aspects of communication and we're able to communicate different things uh, than we can the other technology, the other medium. And so the kind of obvious um, comparison here would be the things like, it's probably too early to say the, the printing press, but you know, the printing press 
it w- was was just an insane development. And and here I mean the Gutenberg press, not the uh, the earlier precursors from China, because the Gutenberg press actually allows you to produce uh, very very inexpensively um, written materials. So the size of the biggest library in the world was more or less constant for 1500 years. Right. And then as soon as the Gutenberg press arrives, the size of the biggest library overnight is like year over year over year, bigger, 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 bigger. Hmm. And the amount of written material, obviously there's no thing as a newspaper, you know, before the printing press, the amount of written material that a normal person can see and hence the importance of literacy. Most people weren't literate until very recently in the world. Um, becomes much more important and we're able to communicate uh, with people that are not our direct interlocutors. So we're able to communicate with the past, we're able to communicate at distance. And that just radically changes the type of words that we interact with. Um, And so, you know, obviously we saw that and I think in a similar way with, uh, uh, with television, um, which, which Malcolm wrote about quite a bit. Um, And I think you can think of this as, as uh, um, just a, 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 no one is going to write or code or or send an email that doesn't have chat GBT or a similar technology alongside you right. because it's it's just it, it makes your your writing more clear. It allows you to kind of get the ideas that yeah, I just can't express. I just need to kind of go back and forth. We used the example when we were chatting uh, b- before this interview about um, I'm having an assistant or a co-pilot who you can bounce ideas off uh, as you try to present an argument, a written argument, a spoken argument. And uh, if you had that, why wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, if you if you had you know David Hume sitting across from you in your office and you're like, I'm sending an email, David, yeah. and, and, and Ernest, Ernest, I got a thought for you. Jane, Jane, come over here. What do you think about this? Like that's effectively what you have now. Yeah. I, I, mean, um, I just, I, I, so, I just got excited by the idea of, of taking David Hume's thought, right. Or, or you know, Bishop Berkeley's thoughts and then just filtering them through a, a Hemingway sensibility and, and making them mine. Like I, I, I have trouble thinking of anything um, intellectually more charismatic than that. Yeah, and I mean I, that's where we're going to be. So why 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 wouldn't why wouldn't I use that? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we have we've seen enough, even from ChatGPT, let alone the kind of what's coming in the next couple of years, to know that uh, that this is this is just how communication is going to happen. No, no one's going to write a newspaper article in the same way you didn't spell check things or, or have it edited before. No one's going to do that without without using these copas. No one's going to write code without this. No one like it's just it, it's going to totally change this workflow. Um, so, uh, the other thing we learned from the history of technology though, with these, these kind of large changes, it's very difficult to predict, uh, what their long run effect is. So the example I really love is, um, is, uh, electricity. So we have, uh, the Edison plant, uh, 1870s, New York city. Um, so we have centralized electricity at that point. How do we generate energy before we use things like a steam engine, or a, with a turbine attached to it. So it's like, think of like a belt mm-hmm. um, or use a water wheel or, or, or a wind turbine. And essentially what, what this belt's going to do is this belt's going to carry energy from whatever producing the, the energy, like the steam engine, up through a factory. So the factory would be like six stories tall and the, the belt will rise up the six stories and attach to machines on each floor and then come down and it'll be spinning and spinning and spinning, generating power. Um, this is why we had like the garment district factories in Toronto and in New York and places like that were, uh, were vertical. So at first we have centralized electricity. Instead of having steam power in the basement, we just plug something in, but otherwise nothing changes. Hmm. Maybe we save a little money. I guess that's okay. It's not a huge improvement in, in our productivity. But once we realize, okay, if I'm plugging something in, I can actually plug every individual machine and I don't need that turbine anymore. Okay, now if I don't need that turbine... I don't need this factory to be six stories tall because I don't need to run any belts in. So now I can uh, I can move one I can move the factory out of the city where if I have like a water wheel or or some other generator power near me I don't need to be near that anymore so I can move the factory wherever I want, and I can turn it horizontal if I want. So I don't have to build the tall building. I just plug every machine in, and once I've turned the factory horizontal, now I can divide the tasks of production into an assembly line, and just pass the pass the good from one and so. From the 1870s of Edison to the 1920s, when we're really using assembly lines in, in earnest, that's, that's 40, 50 years. Yeah. Okay, so it took us a long time 
to no no one from Edison on down would have thought the big effect of electricity on production is allowing the assembly line. Yeah. Like, couldn't even conceive of it. Right. And likewise, these this technology, like I can think of how it affects my current workflow, my current day. It's very hard for me to think about what this means as we develop this technology further and all the compliments to this technology appear. Um, you know, it's uh, uh we just don't know what that's gonna look like. Hmm. And so so it's hard to predict, um, you know, even 10 years from now, uh, how we use this. But it seems powerful enough and has been demonstrated its capabilities that, like, I mean, we were chatting earlier. Like, I was, I was doing some programming uh, I needed to do this week. And uh, I I used ChatGPT to, to handle some of the menial parts of, uh, of the coding. And it cut half the time yeah. that I needed to do the task. Uh, so w- I'm I'm never gonna code any other way again, <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> like yeah. like that's, yeah. that's right. and so, so that that's easy for me to see. But then what does coding look like in 20 years? That's very hard for me to see. What? Um, and so we we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, we we can never we can never predict the long future that well unless we're uh, I guess uh, Jules Verne or <laughs> a handful of others can do it, but yeah. uh, us normal mortals can't. Yeah, Nikola Tesla and Jules Verne and Philip K. Dick they can they can see what's coming. That's it. The rest of us yeah. are done. Uh, what, what you're describing, I think, is, has been called the knowledge paradox, where uh, useless knowledge is abandoned immediately, but useful knowledge changes the terms of what's being understood to the point where the, you can't make predictions even on the most accurate knowledge. Um, Yuval Harari in, uh, in Homo Deus uses the example of uh, Karl Marx and, and his work in, in Dust Capital. Um, very, very accurate, very, very powerful, really, you know, really helped hum- humanity to understand the the, the framework of the economy as it was constituted at that time. And the, the punchline that, that Harari uses at the end of a long paragraph explaining how right Marx was, was that um, unfortunately Marx seems to have forgotten that wealthy capitalists can also read. Um, so of course they read Dust Capital and then they saw some of the sense of it and saw some of the dangers you know, to, their, to their wealth or to their operations in it. And they made the changes that caused the uprise of the proletariat not quite to take, hap- take place, at least not yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so given that, as, it, as was actually said in the uh, article that, where I first discovered you, um, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the, I believe uh, the, the authors uh, said, in my experience as a, as a past teacher, this technology is going to take 10 years before um, we really know what to do with it in education. It's going to take two years for the students to learn how to use it. It's going to take another three years for the teachers to figure out that they're using it. And it's going to take another five years before the administration figures out how they want to treat it, if at all. And given the speed that these things are changing, given the exponential rate of change that I think we, we can assume um, with stuff like this, as an educator... Um, as educators ourselves, what what do you recommend our our attitude toward this be, and our, and whatever initial steps we can take, given that we have no idea what this landscape will look like in five years? Yeah, so really short run, you just need to be aware of you know play around with it and understand just from like a student evaluation perspective, mm-hmm. uh, the way you might think a student would have cheated in the past is not how they're they're going to be cheating today. Right, um, no one's. No one's going to plagiarize by copying a document online. They're going to use ChatGPT, and you should just be aware of that. In the long run, that's not actually what matters. In the long run, what matters is our, our ability to, to teach better. And uh, you should understand that right now, things like ChatGPT are just a black box. But at some point in the near future, you're going to be able to like incorporate all of your teaching material into that so that students have like personalized tutors. Um you're going to be able to, instead of uh, giving out handouts, you'll be able to have customized questions um, for each student until they until they show mastery. And uh, we, we, we would always have loved to do this, but we just couldn't do it um, in the past because it took too much time. Hmm. Um, we can't write individual homework assignments for every student in our class. But, you know, in in the very near future, we will be able to do that uh, using, using these large language models. And this opens up, uh, you know, pretty radical new ways of thinking about how we ensure our students are progressing and our students who are kind of uh, doing really well are able to keep pushing forward and, and not have to wait for people to catch up. And our students who need a little extra help are able to uh, nonetheless get where they need to get to, to show mastery mm-hmm. of the subject. Um, and it's going to allow us to spend a lot more time thinking about what we want the students to learn rather than thinking about how we ensure that they master that topic or how we ensure we, we, we evaluate them correctly. And uh, I'm sure uh, anyone on the education side agrees that it's much more interesting to think about what we want the students to learn 
than to think about how we evaluate them. Yeah. Um, and so, so this makes me very, very optimistic. Um, this is a, a really great new technology that, um, that, uh, yeah, is going, is going to, uh, it, it is basically giving us an assistant. Think of it, think of it this way: an assistant who, who can understand uh, written language um, in a way similar to us, um, and and can help us with a number of tasks that uh, that we. We would have loved to do if only we had an assistant to help us. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but your human assistants aren't perfect either. So it just needs to be good enough. And uh, frankly, it's already good enough. Wow. I mean, that's that's almost a punchline worth ending on. I have, I have a whole bunch more questions. I think this conversation could probably extend well into the evening and, and probably into the next few years. Um, well, hey, I, I have a suggestion for you. Hit me. Throw those questions into chat GPT. We'll see what it says. <laughs> Maybe it'll give you better answers than I could. I, I, I have trouble believing that, but at this point in, in humanity, I'm, I'm willing to believe just about anything. Uh, Dr. Brian, Kevin, thank you so much for, for being with me today. Thanks for helping to explain for those of us who, who don't quite have your background how this thing, ChatGPT, works and what we might need to, to do in response to it to set ourselves up uh, or put ourselves in a position to be that person that you just described, one with, with a a really reliable assistant and and perhaps abilities that are going to make our lives hopefully easier, hopefully give us time to focus on the important stuff, like actually engaging with our students as humans and, and you know, working with them as individuals rather than spending hours and hours homogenizing and trying to, you know, quantify a, a human being. Um, and, and I hope people like you are, are, are part of a lot of these answers and part of a lot of the encouragement that causes us not to treat this as a, as a threat to our existence, but as a a boon to our existence and certainly a, 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 a something that'll help us evolve. Uh, any final words for the folks uh, before you get out of here? Uh, yeah, the, the last word is uh, whatever you see today in this area, the number of incredibly smart people working on generative models uh, is amazing. And the stuff that's not public that uh, you're, you're seeing, you're going to see come down the pipe is just absolutely going to blow your mind uh, in the next couple of years. So, uh, so don't think of this as a, uh, as Dali and ChatGPT is the end, this is this is the beginning hmm. of the use of these models. They're only getting better. Well, I was terrified, and now I'm excited. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Perfect. Nice that was great. Wishing you the best. Join me again next week for another podcast where I'll be speaking to Jeff Shea Mandel. Jeff Shea is the founder and president of Rooks to Cooks, a cooking education and intervention program used, among other places, at Braemar College.